So, good morning. Are you ready? Because, <laughs> you, did you put your seat belts on? Because you see there is a, a, basically the whole team is gonna do a little section, so they're like ready and pumped, and you need to be ready too, because it's gonna melt your brain. So let's go. Uh, in 2015, uh, I went to a storytelling workshop in Rome, and uh, uh, I met Matthew Lund, and he's a storytelling uh, artist, he worked at Pixar for many years, and he was uh, you know, traveling the world talking about the art of story. And uh, it was very inspiring for me to, uh, to attend that uh, event, and it kind of planted a little bit the seed of you know, thinking, okay, in the future, maybe it would be great to work with someone that has such insight and passion for storytelling. And uh, fast forward a few years, that uh, opportunity presented itself. So we ended up actually teaming up with him and uh, uh, developing the project of Sprite Fright. The goals of the uh, Sprite Fright project were fairly simple. One was to push our craft and knowledge in storytelling, so we really wanted to do something that had some entertainment value, and uh, uh, at the same time to always push the, the development of Blender and in you know, all the things that we do with Blender, but especially to uh, focus on the pipeline and make sure that we can collaborate together more efficiently to try and you know, raise the bar a little bit in the complexity of the production and still make sure that things don't crumble and to share that. And uh, that's like the main point that I want to drive here is like the sharing the production knowledge that's at the heart uh, of the mission of the Blender Studio. That is really what we do. We put all this effort in working with Blender and in figuring out stuff and then we put it out there as much as possible. So the journey of making a film is not just the film itself and being able to bring it to the audience, but it's every step of the way. And we try really our best to document it in many ways and to share as much as we can. This is, for example, on our blog. We publish articles, we publish interviews, we publish anything, really. And uh, uh, we have production logs. That's like one of my favorite features that we have on the Blender Studio website, where the artists are sharing on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, the work that they're doing. And uh, we've sh for this project, we've been sharing all the edits of the film. You can enjoy 100 plus versions of the film from the beginning until the end, uh, including with a director's commentary, so that's pretty incredible. And of course, all the tools. I'm going to play a quick reel uh, for the Sprite Fright, uh, kind of making off how some things uh, came together, and then I'm gonna leave the stage to the rest of the team to talk about what they've been doing. Enjoy it.
Hello, 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 hello. I thought he was going to introduce me. So, uh, my name is Hjalti Hjalmarsson. Uh, I was the co-director on this thing, but not only that, uh, I did other things. You're wearing many hats, of course. But uh, these were, this was the little team that was doing some of the story stuff, but in different time zones. So, Dirk and Matthew, they would uh, do a lot of... Um, doing a lot of storyboard sessions together. And then in the morning when I woke up, there would be like this whole batch waiting for me with like script updates. So every morning was very fun. Uh, and then you go over it and you iterate. And then, you know, at the end of the day, after like a full work day, I had a, you know, one to three hour session with Matthew. We're going over everything, making sure everything's clear. Uh, I, I, sometimes, I have this tendency to press control S when I'm just working, just to save. Apparently Skype, makes a snapshot every now and then. So I have like a list of random things that I snap. Anyway, uh, his original pitch was this kind of Smurfs gone bad and the kind of tone of it was Gremlins meets Shaun of the Dead. So it is horror, but it's not trying to be necessarily gory, but it's supposed to have this humorous kind of side to it. But the original story, I think I was looking at some of the original drawings. Uh, they were more gory, to be honest, and uh, it's kind of interesting. So we, we had to kind of find that balance. Um, but all of those drawings, uh, somebody had to put them in an edit. So that was me putting on the editorial hat and start putting it all together. And, you know, putting some uh, temp score, temp sound effects, all of that stuff. But not only that, I was butchering Dirk's drawings severely. So in order to accomplish whatever I needed, I was full on mangling it, drawing my own stuff and doing what, whatever was needed. Now, once I had that animatic, uh, we had this kind of spatial problem because this is not going to be a 2D um, animation. This is going to be 3D. And then how do you start uh, having a conversation spatially about everything? Uh, so I made my own little rig like usually you do a floor plan you do a drawings and whatnot and Matthew started doing some of it but um, it kept changing and it got a little bit confusing so I figured hey uh, let me just make something like this and I'll just animate it this is like 10 times the speed so just so you got a gist of it so this became kind of at least the foundation of where the camera could be and we could try different things out and kind of spatially between the different sets where they should be Anyway, I have very little time because I'm doing okay. Uh, and then as I'm doing the layout, kind of moving on from there, uh, a lot of the stuff is still being designed. So sometimes uh, there are whole sets that don't exist, and I, but I know roughly from some drawings what they kind of maybe look like. So I just start doing random stuff. And sometimes I'm, a lot of times, I'm just using primitives and, and just figuring stuff out. The, this is like actually a more advanced rig than what I was using earlier on. So you just have to kind of make do with what you have. And for example, oh, she rescues a bird. I'm like, great, where's the bird? Wow, well, we don't have the bird. So I'm just, okay, here's a cube, your doo -doo 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 -doo, and flappy things, and you have a bird. And it conveys the story, so that's it. You don't need anything more. Um, yes, so in layout, this is just an example of what uh, the layout process looks like if you kind of take another camera and you look at it from the outside, you see there's like a lot of spatial cheating going on and that kind of stuff, but that's the fun of it. It's a four-dimensional puzzle, per se. Uh, just to touch a little bit upon the cinematography, the, it kind of does feel like two different films. One of them is more calm and quiet when it comes to the camera movements that are very controlled, and the other one is a little bit more chaotic. So it kind of goes into this wondrous, uh, Steven Spielberg-esque thing to more of a evil dead horror kind of a thing. And there were a couple of shots that were like inspired directly by some choices. Um, this was as far as we actually took the whole Edgar Wright thing. I pushed it further because he's like, ah, really, it's some, something about it. And I pushed it way further and uh, it became like a parody of itself. So we had to tone it back down. So I think that's the only thing that remains in the film. Um, the actual editorial, there's so many things that you have to uh, handle. Uh, there's also, you know, there's the scratch dialogue and the script is changing, the dialogue is changing, so you have to redo all the recordings and you have to spice them together. Every single potential uh, sentence has 20 different takes. And then you start splicing those together into the take that you want. So for example, this sentence uh, was not a one take thing. She was never in the same room saying just this one sentence. It's taken out of many different takes uh, recorded at different times. 
So there's a lot of like this. There's a lot of this that goes on with, uh, for editors. Like, oh, she didn't say it, this word in plural, but the take is nice. Can you find an S? I'll find that S. <laughs> So you might think of all of these things as a kind of a nice conveyor belt, but really it's a little bit more complicated and there's way more kind of symbiotic relationship back and forth. And usually the editorial sits kind of in the middle of it and it gets even more confusing. Uh, but uh, once you have it all together, like you kind of snap the puzzle together, it's very satisfying. It kind of becomes this satisfying piece of artwork. Speaking of artwork, here is our art director, Andy Goralczyk. Okay, we don't have a lot of time. So um, Sprite Fight was uh, easily one of the most complicated productions that we had at our studio. Um, we had lots of characters, lots of props. And not only that, the characters went through multiple stages of wear and tear, which made it very complicated because that's something that we never did up to this point, like some, a character that gets hurt, that bleeds and everything. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the early production process um, um, uh, shortly, even before we got on board with this. Um, uh, a lot of this complicated production, um, the magic trick was to make something as complicated as that uh, look very simple. So it was an exercise in simplifying things. Um, so before uh, we saw anything, uh, Ricky Nerva, the production designer, he's a character designer at Pixar, um, also production designer of Up, um, he uh, spent a lot of time with Matthew developing character concepts and dueling around. Um, so there were literally hundreds of drawings of these characters in different stages. And uh, the characters had to, uh, you know, they're, they're the main cast. We had uh, five, was five, five characters, five main characters, seven, ten, yeah, uh, yeah. billions of sprites. Um, so um, they, uh, at some point, we, um, we boiled it down to, okay, this has to happen in Great Britain because we want to make it more uh, European. So um, this was the line lineup that uh, Ricky made for the characters. And uh, okay, so where do we start? Um, at the beginning, it was only it was only Hjalti, me, Matthew, and Ricky. And uh, how do you tackle something as finding a style for a film like that? So the easiest thing to start with is not with the characters, but with a prop. So we actually decided to start with the boombox of Jay because uh, Ricky did a little uh, little style sheet of that, and we wanted to figure out okay, how do we make this movie work in, in three dimensions? How do we find the style and the language of the shapes of every, everything? So this was my first pass of it. Um, very rough, just um, blocking out shapes and everything and um, following the design pretty faithfully. And you can see like there are some crooked shapes here and there, but we, um, the, the core of the design language is there. It's uh, chunkiness, that's what Ricky wanted. So um, the detail is a little bit bigger than uh, in reality because the characters are also very stylized. Their hands are bigger and they have uh, these simple shapes that are based on. So the props also have to reflect that. Um, so the sprite thread is somewhere in the middle between uh, something that is a model and a realistic uh, representation of that prop. This is what the final boombox ended up being. You can see it's a little bit more straight. We wanted to make the shapes not too crooked, so it's not wonky and all uh, uh, skewy and so on. So it's a little bit you know, more chunky. That chunkiness is still in there. Textures are also simplified. The local contrast is simplified. And that's kind of the language that later on we apply to all the different props, that level of magnification of detail. Um, make it look like a toy. This because Matthew uh, kind of comes from a family of uh, toy store owners. Um, so with the characters, it was a little bit more complicated because it was a big cast and uh, um, uh, Julian's going to show more of the actual modeling process. But very early on, it was about uh, these simple shapes that reflect the personality of the character. That's what the drawing that Ricky made. And then he asked me to just take that into 3D because he was a 2D designer and he didn't really know how this is gonna work in 3D, how the volume's gonna work, how the character's gonna get, behave in relation to each other. And that actually reflected back to his design process because he kept working with these volumes and tried to push things a little bit back and forth. And this was the, um, the approved uh, 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 character sheet for a long time until we got on board and even iterated more. But Julian's gonna show that. Um, the environment was a little bit more complex because Ricky wasn't that, uh, um, you know, he wanted to give us a little bit more leeway with the environment design. So this is a very early uh, environment test, um, finding out some you know, wonky shapes that work with the character shapes. 
Um, we did a few of these tests, but we really wanted to do something that uh, fits more into the film and also test the different uh, daytimes because we have this uh, we have this bright side of the film and the dark side of the film. So we decided to do the first environment test with the yew tree. Um, it's a it's a tree type that's found in uh, in Europe in graveyards, so it's very spooky. Um, that's the tree that uh, Jay actually dies in. And uh, we, uh, we got this drawing from Dirk, and uh, we pretty much uh, transferred it into a 3D model. Simon made some uh, rough shaders, and we tried to put this together. OK, we want to have kind of realistic lighting, realistic uh, uh, surfacing, but stylized shapes. Um, this is at daytime, and this is at nighttime. So at nighttime, we removed some of the detail um, and, uh, and made it more skeletal. Um, which, that was great, because now uh, it wasn't just a conversation anymore, it was actually a thing that you see and you can look at it with your eyes. And also, at the same time, character blocking was going on, so we were able to put the characters into that set as well and see if it works. In that case, um, not so much, because we figured out, okay, the characters are so expressive, how do we make it with the environment if the environment is equally you know, busy, it's, gonna, it's not going to work because you're not going to be able to focus on the characters. So we had to really find out, okay, what do we remove? How do we simplify things and how do we make the characters read? Um, a little bit shortly after that, we had a concept artist called Bill, uh, Todd Polson uh, work with us uh, for a brief period of time. He actually had a good point and he was seeing these environment renders um, uh, and he was thinking, okay, um, how can we stylize the shapes even more? So he made this drawing of uh, these very stylized mushroom shapes, and I tried to kind of make a little scene with that to see how would it work. Uh, you can see the sprite character here in the background. And so we have this little scene with grass and the sprite in the background, okay, with uh, some light and some cool shaders on top of it. Um, yeah, it looks a little bit too busy because the grass is just very noisy. We are, we're not focused on the sprites, really. So um, the thing was, okay, let's find a way how to remove a lot of that detail. So we use clovers instead of grass, and we use bigger patches of uh, soil. And uh, that's how that scene came to be. So this was like as a kind of testing ground to you know have a conversation. Um, how do we how do we find those chunky shapes in the environment? How do we make the character read? How do we use uh, light and color values to make the character be separated from the background? And how does uh, the chunkification work with the character? Later on, that became kind of a, a, a test graphic, uh, a banner graphic for the Blender Cloud. We polished it a little bit further. And uh, this is how it ended up being. So next, it's going to be Julian, our character artist. All right, thank you very much. So um, I was mainly responsible for the sculpting and the modeling side on the characters uh, for half of the production, uh, which of course, because we had such simple um, character designs, was actually super easy to do. You just basically start from a sphere and um, sculpt the final character. So I mean, the, the Elder Sprite is basically a sphere, so it's easy, right? But as uh, it turns out, there was much more to it and was quite different than anything that I've done before. Um, I would actually start, uh, say there's a bit of a misconception that I was living by, and I think uh, a lot of people do, and that's like that you typically think you start out with a 2D concept, and uh, that the concept artists and the, the, uh, all the people involved in that are figuring out the design, and then the 3D artist comes in and recreates the design as faithfully as possible. Um, but so I, I basically snatched the at the time latest approved concept art from the sprites, this one, uh, uh, made by Ricky Niava, and I made a sculpt of it. And uh, this is what came out of it uh, in like half of a week. I, I just threw it in there as an appetizer, and I thought, okay, this uh, already looks kind of good, but it led to a lot of confusion. Uh, it's not really what I was expecting. So because the plan was actually to not take these drawings as holy, but they're sort of the, the starting point, the conversation piece to uh, find the core design principles for each character. And then we would go into 3D 
and have a whole collaborative process of actually figuring out how the characters are supposed to look like. So uh, after all of that process, uh, this is what came out of it, the final 3D characters. Um, and it's really interesting. Like the, the first takeaway, the first lesson that I kind of took out of it is that you really need to go into 3D as soon as possible because the character designs changed completely. Some of them, were, the original designs were completely scratched. So um, you start to work more iter iteratively and then refine them as you go along. Um, and even like the simplest lineup at the start helps a lot to give you a base to start off. Um, with these really simple shapes and then adding more complexity on top. Um, the, the second thing I really learned a lot uh, early on is uh, you should really develop all the characters at the same time. Uh, uh, we were lucky that we didn't have a lot of people, so I actually got to work on all of the characters and sculpting. Um, but I still tended to go ahead and, um, and work on one character first. And whenever we did that, whenever we, we rushed ahead and worked on, for example, Ellie over here in isolation, uh, we noticed later on she, the, she doesn't fit at all with any of the other characters anymore. Um, so we went back and readjusted the design, heavily changed it, and um, tried to progress all the characters evenly at the same time, so to keep the style consistent. Um, it, this basically ended up in a similar issue as with the sprite in the beginning, where it just didn't fit what uh, we ended up doing. Um, another important thing, though, is uh, this, this sounds kind of strict, but you should really not be too strict with this workflow. Um, sometimes we just went out of our way to make a fully post sculpt to just try something out with, uh, for example, in this case, with the mouth shapes, how cartoony we can go. And this gives you a lot of ideas on how to get a, an appealing design, how far you want to take the style. But a lot of these sculpts were completely throwaway. Like some of them were never used. Um, but that doesn't mean you're wasting time. Uh, actually taking a bit of time to make these experimentations, to make actual expression and post tests, tells you so much that you will save a lot of time in the long run uh, on trying to fix issues that it did, you didn't foresee. Um, for the characters, we actually uh, went a lot with uh, a design principle that Ricky called simplexity. Uh, in a nutshell, it's like sort of starting with a simple design, like with Elder Sprite over here with just a sphere and a hat on top of it. And then uh, when you start to add more detail on top, you try to not disrupt or distract from that original design language. Um, so uh, we tried to go for that, but it's really important to remember that, that doesn't mean you should go for simple shapes. It doesn't mean that the 3D model needs to be simple. It just needs to look simple. Uh, there are so many invisible compromises that uh, are like when you see the characters it's just like it's a sphere like it's just simple bucket shapes but there are many breaks and changes in the shape in three dimensions to make the character as appealing as possible from all angles and appeal is really needs to be the deciding factor in this um, so uh, as we went along uh, we uh, started uh, testing the character sculpts even more, making like temporary retopologies and sculpting on top of it, trying out all kinds of expressions and post tests, uh, making entire sheets. Uh, these were mostly based on actual, uh, the actual storyboards of the movie or any sort of expression or moment from the movie that we needed to see if it works with the style that we have, if it's appealing. Um, so we collected all of this information uh, of what we're aiming for and created a style guide. Um, and this really encompassed all of the takeaways for how these characters are supposed to look and emote and deform. And that got passed on always and refined further, to, uh, giving it to, to the next artist. Like, for example, uh, taking it further into retopology. Angela, uh, Jeanette really did a fantastic job to uh, create a topology that suits uh, this crazy cartoony deformation um, and without f some f uh, first expression tests uh, we maybe would have missed that and uh, it would have le led to some uh, less than ideal animation later on. Um, so, but that's basically my part of it. I'm going to hand it over to Vivian. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I did visual 
uh, development on Sprite Write, but I came uh, uh, on production. I came on board a little later for the pre-production than everyone else when it was already going at full force, and the characters were looking roughly like uh, this. And you can see that Ellie, for example, she's not looking quite like herself yet. She's got these pointy elbows and knees, and she actually was called Emily at that time. And um, I was tasked with making the characters sit uh, better in the environment and you know, fit better with each other. And um, I think by, by the time we made this concept art, we were quite successful with that. And yeah, how did I manage and what was it like to work on this production? Um, the idea said that um, making a movie is like uh, laying the tracks while you are already riding the train. Well, from my point of view, it was more like, well, there's five speeding trains and I am meant to decorate them. And by the napkins and curtains that I'm choosing, they somehow magically end up crashing into the same beautiful sunset. And yeah, so it means that in a way, nobody waits around for concept art to be done to continue working. Everyone is constantly making stuff. So for me, it was really important to squint very hard, keep this wide gaze approach, and, but also at the same time, somehow be very detail oriented. So um, what really helped was that we already, by the point I joined, had this emerging gold standard. I think Rex and Phil were always working. Everyone always had the hots for Rex and Phil. And we kind of could you know, just look at those and kind of derive from them, what does a tree look like? What does a bird look like? And yeah, that, that's something your local concept artist can probably do for you. And I tried to, with every bigger concept painting, inform as many departments as possible at the same time. So we got something to talk about and uh, nitpick. And this one, for example, as you saw, it was recreated in 3D. And I think it overshot the style by a little bit, but it gave us a lot of information but also you really, really don't want to take too long with concept art because when I was still shading the little bark detail, Andy was done with the tree, it was already <laughs> approved by the director. So yeah, you probably, as a 2D artist, want to focus on stuff that is just quicker in 2D than in 3D, whatever you can do there, which for example here is uh, costume variations. Like for some time I got really obsessed with her little Miss Piggy feet and I designed all these 80s shoes for her and that's just, kind of quick, and I also tried to help out with effects because we really needed to know what, what would it look like to have these melting sprites and maybe we would have animated fire, maybe not. And uh, I also did tons and tons of drawovers, like hundreds, and paint overs, but I mostly ended up chunkifying everything because that just, you know, that worked. And um, it's, I think it's quite obvious, but the bigger the sample size from your universe becomes, the easier it becomes to just generate designs for your designer. And you know, once we had the human characters done, it became way more streamlined to do the animals, and we could go with a way more default process. As in, you, know, you present options to your director, they turn down your favorites, and then you move on. <laughs> Uh, or you end up crashing into your own little sunset with bird age, which, you know, I'm willing to do that, but... Um, and then, you know, by the time we got to the props, it was even easier because we had, you know, a lot of the other props already, actually, and, you know, that only took two days because, you know, we know what the world looks like. And I got a shit ton of wonderful 80s references. Kind of easy. Something that was way less easy is making the color script uh, because the movie was still constantly changing. And um, as you can see here, these bunnies at the very top, they didn't make it into the movie. The ending there, that was cut. But it's in the color script here. And, um, but it really helps to just paint your characters over and over, very small in different light circumstances kind of helps you to boil down the color identity of your movie. And I think this is almost the Lego test where you check like which kind of colors are really relevant for your character. And like, you try to remove a lot of the other stuff that is just busy. And um, what it also helped identify is this green on green issue where you know green characters in a very green environment. And you kind of try to come up with 
solutions for that, and then you end up making the ground brown, and you're done. Like, magic, right? It just works. And yeah, that's when you hopefully ended up voicing all your concerns, all your ideas, and you end up with something like this as a concept artist, and then you can just watch from the sidelines as the movie gets done, right? Hey guys, uh, I'm Demeter, and I rigged all the characters on Sprite Fright. <coughs> and uh, the way that I did that, well, um, the first we had to consider what's going to be the tricky thing about this project, and that was that uh, there's quite a few characters. So there's, of course, the five teenagers, but then there's also other Sprite and the Sprite. And on the side, there's a bunch of forest creatures. So it's a lot of characters in a limited time. And uh, we wanted to keep the rigs consistent, at least between the teenagers, since they are all humanoid and quite similar, but even the sprites. And consistency is important so that you know, animators don't have to relearn seven different rigs, obviously. <coughs> so the solution that we came up with kind of before this project, but mostly for this project, was procedural rigs, which of course many studios use at this point, and it's kind of the standard. Um, but for the Blender Studio, this was relatively new at the time. And so the workflow for what I call procedural rigging, um, you know, in the future, hopefully one day, maybe soon, it's going to be a node-based thing. But for now, this is a, just a, a Python add-on. So many of you might be familiar, well, those of you who are familiar with rigging might be familiar with Rigify. And uh, we basically used Rigify, but extended it with our own uh, features. And that set of features was, uh, in the end, called CloudRig. Um, <coughs> and so the way this works is you create something called a MetaRig, which is just a, a simple skeleton that kind of defines the character's proportions. Uh, you know, like where are their elbows and where is their spine, which is pretty simple. And then additionally, on top of that, the MetaRig also contains information about um, its like parameters and values about what kind of control rig should be generated uh, based on that MetaRig. So, and, and the actual behavior of that is implemented in Python, and then you just click Generate Rig, and you get yourself a control rig, as you can see. Um, and so the tricky part is uh, just uh, implementing the code is one thing, and then getting the right parameters that your animators need uh, on the MetaRig, and then you just generate a rig, and that's it. Um, and then an important uh, tech that, uh, th that we used um, for the facial deformations of the characters was the shrink wrap modifier, which basically just uh, snaps one surface to another. And so what I'm not showing here is uh, there's a, a hidden helper mesh for Rex in this case, but also for every other character. Um, and that helper mesh is only being deformed by the head bone and the jaw and nothing else. So it's not being deformed by the mouth. Uh, instead, um, the mouth, the actual mouth of the character is of course being deformed as you can see. Um, and then after that, that gets snapped onto that helper mesh. And uh, this helps uh, preserve the silhouette and keep it clean, even though the bones and the weighting and the deformations might not initially be perfect. Um, and so, besides that, let's uh, talk a bit about the forest creatures, because I think they're kind of fun. So this is uh, Mr. Snail, my favorite character in the movie. And uh, his rigging was actually quite simple. Um, we just used the lattice for, for the cheek puff, uh, which I can highly recommend. Oh man, an Apple ID, do not allow. Go away. <laughs> oh boy, I don't know if you guys saw that, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, that was the, the snail, it was pretty simple. Um, in the end, the animators of course wanted to do all kinds of uh, squashy things on them, so they also have like a giant lettuce that encompasses the entire snail to, to squash it. Um, and then next up, an interesting one was the spider. Um, I believe most of the shots of the spider uh, were animated by uh, Monica Eggers. If you've met her, then you know she's freaking amazing. And so she did a fantastic job. And uh, the, the tricky thing about the spider was this uh, zigzaggy legs that had to be um, working in IK and also had to straighten out and uh, get squashed in, uh, in some shots. Um, and uh, it was amazing to have a procedural rigging workflow for the spider because it had eight legs, and those legs were a bit tricky, and they did need quite a bit of iteration to, to get right. And so I was very happy that I didn't have to do that iteration eight times over every single time that we would make a change. Um, I just made the changes in the code, and then I regenerated the rig, and all of the legs, reg all of the legs were updated with the new behavior that the animator asked for. Uh, and. Uh, then there was the, the bird, and this one was uh, tricky in a completely different way, in that it's, uh, of course, covered in a bunch of feathers, which was very annoying, but um, 
because uh, all of those feathers, there's, I couldn't really come up with any magical way to not make them constantly clip into each other. So we just kind of did it the brute force way. And um, yeah, we just set up some shape keys and action constraints to try to fold the wing down with as little clipping as possible. Um, and then there was a lot of iteration on that because, of course, people kept running into poses where it would still clip. Uh, but yeah, we did our best. And I think even if there is clipping, you can't really see it in the movie. <coughs> Uh, and I, I also made a, a special rig type just for each individual feather so that they can be controlled in a nice way. Um, yeah. And okay, and then finally, um, the final interesting thing that we kind of uh, started doing in Sprite Fright was uh, rigged uh, hair particles. Um, it was always possible to sort of rig hair in Blender, but um, the way you would have to do that, well, the only way that you could do it uh, before, as far as we knew, was that the entire hair strand would uh, just follow the surface that it's growing out of, which is not great for long hair. So uh, Sergey ended up packing us um, <coughs> a, a quick blender patch and some Python scripts that allowed us to create a, a sort of um, binding mesh for the hair. And um, <coughs> then we could deform that uh, binding mesh um, and the particles would, would follow it. And so that's what we used for all the characters um, to deform their particle hairs. And that is it for me. And next up is my third favorite animator. OK, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, animation and how the animation style came to be. Um, when we were looking at the initial designs, the first question as animators we ask is like, how do we marry the animation style with the uh, actual characters? And it's not only about uh, the character design, like if you see uh, Phil on the very right side, you don't see it's Phil, but it's a very different shape than, for example, Rex or, or Ellie. So to kind of like support that in terms of weight, but also in terms of uh, character personality, which, um, for example, um, Ellie is a very insecure girl, goes through this ar uh, arc of being a hero in the end, and uh, Rex is this uh, macho guy. So next is also uh, um, the story, like the story has different pacing. We go from a lot of dialogue to action scenes and how do these char characters behave in those different environments, different scenes. Now you can talk endlessly about animation, but uh, for me, once the one rig was ready, somewhat ready, we um, uh, I, this is my uh, first animation test I did with a somewhat working rig, and um, a lot of things uh, could be uh, like one of the great things about this is that you can start the conversation. Um, but it also uh, um, uh, pops up more questions like, do we want smears? Do we want to animate on ones, on twos? And the same goes for all of the sprites. Like, how do, these, how do we keep these sprites um, uh, jolly and then ultimately turn them into evil monsters? Um, one of the big decisions that we had to make is animation on twos. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, one second of traditional film is 24 frames, 24 drawings. And we basically decided to hold every frame for two frames. So we end up with 12 drawings per second. Um, um, so that's, that's called animation on twos. Now, here is a comparison where we uh, animated. Do we have sound on here? OK. Oh, OK. Uh, so the, the left one was animation on ones, and the right one was animation on twos. And we decided to animate on twos uh, a bunch of reasons. One of them is to really uh, emphasize the toy feeling of it and really go towards the stop motion uh, style of animation. But also, you know, the budgetary reason of not uh, having to animate 24 frames, but only 12, and also not have to care about any motion blur. Now. That, while still having a 24 frame uh, movie, uh, 24 frames per second, it came with some, some issues that popped up uh, mainly with camera motion, because the camera motion is moving on. Wait, uh, this is uh, playing in a sec. So the cam camera motion is uh, moving on once, while the animation is moving on two. So you get a strobing effect. Um, does it play? Come on. And. Um, uh, so what we did is basically 
It's a little clip. So what we did on camera motion is animate the root of the character, the root bone, along with the camera, but the local animation, the arms and the legs, animate uh, animation on twos. Uh, to keep that style consistent, but not make it too jarring for, uh, for fast action. So that's something we did here. You see the characters moving out of frame on ones while the animation, the character animation itself within is on twos. Now, with, here we go, with, um, whoa, one sec. With the uh, animation on twos, we lost the motion blur. So we had to, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, implement all traditional ways of, of emulating motion blur by adding smear frames, distorting the meshes, and using crease pencil to uh, enhance or like draw extra extra lines. Um, and, and these smears are multiples. You couldn't apply everywhere. It would be a big uh, uh, mess, but really it had to be earned per, per action. And another thing we um, applied, one sec, here we go, is um, adding um, the grease pencil and converting them to geometry for effects like the bird poop, for uh, gooey uh, melting sprites. And that was a great way to, to have full control over the simulation, so to speak, but also a quick way to iterate over shots. Uh, over uh, the effects. So it was for the director, you don't have to wait for endless um, uh, endless uh, simulation time, but really could draw in some, some quick sketches and then later refine that uh, for, um, um, yeah, when, whenever it was approved. So it was a great way to also stylize the effects uh, and I think they look great in the, in the movie and fit well. Um, so. Next will be Pablo, and he will be talking about uh, some facial lip sync animation. Hello, I'm Pablo. Um, basically, I'm going to continue a bit with what Rick was saying about how we decide to stylize everything, uh, but this time on the facial. So, um, and Julian started to uh, make some of the uh, sculpts to try to figure out the simplicity on the characters. And these ones, they really help us in the moment we had uh, Rick to start to push the poses and uh, see if we could achieve something like that with the technology we had. Um, this process was a really long process between all the departments and so into the director. Uh, we end up having uh, like, um, uh, like a group of, uh, of uh, expressions that we wanted to uh, um, recreate with the rig, and we were thinking that they were precisely the, the, the expressions that they were gonna be through the movie and the characters. So we have uh, this, uh, this already animated, so it was really, uh, really helpful to have the scopes and see if we could recreate them with the rig in motion, and they were gonna be holding up or not. Um, we did this with all the characters, so um, yeah, we try to also like really go. It's not playing, no. Playing, yes. So we try to push all the all the um, characters and really um, aim for the simplicity and aiming for uh, the mouth almost being like to the mouth. So that was how we really push everything and uh, really like uh, even like. Mm, making them working for uh, the view, for the camera view, but in the moment you were turning the character, it was exploding. So it was like really like, yeah, just working for that frame in that um, camera moment. So um, I'm gonna, uh, also all these, uh, all these poses later, we didn't have to recreate them all the time. So we did use the post library um, it was really helpful to keep uh, consistency during uh, all the production and with all the animators we had. So yeah, all these expressions, they were great. Uh, and it was a pre-production work we, that we really used through all the production. I'm gonna guide you a bit through um, my lip sync process and how I do it. Not the best, but let's see. Um, I'm gonna play the clip first. And you 
this is a shot. Uh, I like to start just putting the key poses on the body, telling the action and telling uh, what the character is going to do. And then I usually do um, facial pass with a strong sounds or a strong emotions that they are going to be close to that poses. So like this, I have some reference of the character. Is it going to be angry? Is it going to have the mouth open, mouth closed? So from then, I put more information, more poses on the character. When I'm comfortable with something that I have, and I think that is kind of representing already the full thought, I show it to my supervisors, and then we have notes. Uh, in this case, in this, project, in, in this project, it was mostly pushing mm, mouth poses bigger most of the times because we wanted to go really cartoony, so it was push it, push it, push it. I uh, continue this process of adding more information, refining the body and refining the facial and we go, go and on and on and on and on with the retakes, with the, with the, with the notes. So like pushing, 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 pushing until we end up, we don't have more time to, the, to finish the shot. I mean, it's like the, the deadline of the shot and then you have something like this. Uh, that doesn't have any sound, but <laughs> yeah, this is the last uh, already, everything Polish uh, has um, mustache, well, everything is animated, so that's what it ended up being on the movie. That's my part. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Bo. I'm a 3D artist on Sprite Fight. And I'll talk a bit more about the practical side of uh, how we approach lighting. So, is it like? Great. So, um, planning really helped out in most of the cases for the sequences. Uh, for instance, when the students here set camp and you would um, create an init initial um, um, lighting uh, pass of the establishing shot, and the plan is to copy and paste and refine it, this particular shot, uh, to the other ones. So um, uh, well, this creates a, a better workflow, basically. Um, and the values are mostly consistent. Um, so once we have an uh, entire lighting pass, we will throw it into Kitsu. So uh, here we can, uh, also for animation, but in this case for lighting, we can just throw it in there and we can compare it. We can compare it to, uh, uh, compare it to the, the values and it has annotations, which is really nice. Um, and uh, this way we mostly iterate it on the lighting. So but before we can start lighting, we have to, of course, build it. So quickly go into how this is done. So uh, we use the Shop Builder tool, uh, basically combining the animation and the set. Um, and we added a predefined sky, um, which has like this, basically like a ramp, so no HDRIs. And uh, this way we created a, a consistent like global illumination. Well, it's not real global illumination, but um, uh, yeah, color. Um, and if there are any gaps, we will fill them with bushes and trees and um, basically start adding key lights and uh, shadow casters, as we call them, or light blockers. Um, so uh, the lights in Sprite Fright, these are the lights we used, uh, have their own attributes and purposes. Um, so the key light, especially for this particular sequence, was to mimic the warm sun when they were setting up the camp. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, and then rim lights, we place them uh, behind the characters to separate them from the background. The fill lights, we place above the characters, usually to create uh, more dimensionality, uh, to also fake a bit of the global illumination on them as well. And to soften the characters' faces, we would add soft fill lights uh, on the dark side of the characters' faces to uh, basically create better appeal. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, the shadow casters or light blockers, so 
uh, light linking at this stage we didn't really use. Um, <coughs> so we used meshes. And uh, the nice thing about it as well is that we could also like block uh, glossy rays. So if there were objects that were too shiny, we could also, for instance, turn off the diffuse and only have, for instance, well, it depends on the effect. Um, so we have more control for the final image. Uh, finally, we add atmospheric effects, uh, basically an emission shader with um, a 2D texture that emits lights to uh, to, um, to fake uh, uh, light shafts, basically. So, um, for me, um, this really uh, created a really nice uh, structured way to work from. So, um, trying to maintain within the style and the vision of the movie and using these guidelines, the, the way we use the lights, how we place them, the predefined presets and stuff like that uh, really helped. Um, this is another thing. Uh, it's just a context sheet. Uh, I used it a couple of times to compare the values uh, in a sequence. So we could say, okay, well, this shot needs a bit more key light, for instance, um, um, uh, created by Paul. Let's see this over there. So um, anyway, um, but um, besides maintaining consistency, it's not always the goal to have that. Sometimes you really want to do more uh, cinematic-based lighting, which uh, where you can break the consistency and the continuity to improve. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, to improve the, um, the story and the, the, the character dialogue, for instance. So if you take a look here at these shots, especially near Elder Sprite, we see a shadow there and a somewhat different lighting direction when compared to this one. Now you don't really necessarily notice it when you watch it, but because you want to focus on the, on the story, it really emphasizes it. So um, yeah, this way, it really depends on the scene and what you value. Um, and yeah, the, talking about values, the master of values. Simon, that's it. Okay. Hi, I'm Simon. We're already running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to try and speed through. Uh, I was doing uh, shading and some of the effects on Sprite Fright. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, shading principles. So once we had the style guide set and knew what the movie is supposed to look like, we had this like toy-like feeling and wanted to chunkify all the details. Uh, we had a style guide for the, uh, for the shading principles. So one of those aspects is that we wanted to have the surfaces have really large enlarging patterns, so they're larger than life to make it a little bit more like, small scale and toy like Another thing was chunky uh, details to uh, also not distract with a lot of small noisy detail. And then keep the specularity overall pretty low for the appeal also. And alongside that also make the metal values quite rough overall. And then uh, also keep the bump, uh, de bump detail quite low in profile. And within the surfaces have a relatively low contrast. So we have these strong and clearly defined colors that we don't deviate too much from within a surface. And then uh, also what Vivian was working on, defining the palette in a way uh, that is clear and we don't deviate from that too much. And then for the uh, character shading specifically, something that we wanted to uh, ha uh, focus on is not make it too realistic in the sense of actually skin, but still make it flashy and alive. So it's very stylized. We don't have, don't, didn't want to have any bump, but have like a slight marbling effect just to make it a little bit uh, more appealing and uh, a subtle SSS to make the characters, characters come alive, but not too realistic in the sense of actually creating skin. And in terms of colors, for the characters specifically, we had these very two different moods in the daytime and in the nighttime. And to be sure that we can hit the right style in terms of colors also, we uh, actually baked a different color palette into the shaders themselves, where you could switch between a night version and a day version, and depending on that switch, they would use different colors in the shaders directly. So we didn't have to rely on the color grading afterwards to make that mood hit, uh, but we could also just do it in the beginning of the pipeline. An important aspect of the shading, especially for the story, was the character arc that the main character was going through from, in, in terms of the distression, where she's clean in the beginning and then, yeah, bruised and everything in the end. And that was really important on the uh, story level for the main character, but also for all the other characters, it was pretty important to 
marry them into the environment and make sure that they uh, work together with the, uh, with the world and the story. And for that, the process was that Vivian was making drawovers for all the characters, and I tried to implement all of those different details into the shaders directly. And yeah, there were lots of smaller things we did here and there, scratches, running mascara, dirt, and ripped clothing. And for the main character, that was a little bit more tricky because it needed to uh, be several different stages throughout the movie to make sure that every single stage, every, every interaction with the environment is reflected in the, uh, in the discretion of the character. And for that, we built it into the shaders as well with a bunch of parameters where we could actually change the slide around for every single shot to make sure it's all consistent and, yeah, hits the right frames. Um, then a little bit about the props and the shading in general. So I, there were a lot of props to be shaded. So I like to also in general rely on a more procedural workflow. I create a bunch of base shaders that I can just uh, copy around then and then very easily paint in a bunch of masks. And also for the, uh, for the detail and the patterns also rely on a, a procedural workflow where you can get quick iterations, make changes here and there at every point in time of the process, basically. That was really helpful. And also uh, combining that with uh, effects that we would use something like geometry nodes for, uh, which was, Spiper was the first project where we had uh, the opportunity to use geometry nodes. And we did that a lot in the environment. And then also the shaders could be uh, informed by, for example, here, the moss that we're scattering around. And speaking about geometry nodes, they're all over the place in the environment. So the, all the leaves scattering, the grass, uh, the moss, some of the clouds, it's all using geometry nodes, which at the time it was a very different system, so <laughs> it was a little bit tricky here and there, but it uh, was really, really useful. And other than that, about the environment, it was mostly just about uh, making sure that it works with the characters, that the characters fit into the world, but doesn't overwhelm everything and make sure that the characters can really shine. And then a little bit about the effects. So for Sprite, right, Sprite Fight, we were using various different uh, methods for the effects. One thing was simulation. That was uh, what Andy was in charge of, pretty much. We had a bunch of simulation here and there. And then another thing would be animated props, where we just have a, uh, have a rake on a prop, and then the animators would take care of actually making sure that it looks like a nice effect. Um, another thing that's something that Rick also mentioned, we would actually frame by frame animate some things, like uh, with grease pencil, the uh, the, the splashes from the sprites, for example, and then turn that into a mesh that we can then render with the lighting of the scene. And then lastly, I think, the geometry nodes effects. So I tried to, wherever I could, actually incorporate geometry nodes, for, like, uh, for example, to create a prop where you had uh, the hairspray effects with a bunch of sliders, and then paste them into the shots and really easily adjust them without having to actually manually uh, do anything on top of that. Then a lot of the melting effects, and like also, for example, the snails scattered around on the body of Rex. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the melting effects in more detail. So here's how it looks in the actual file. So it's all a system in a single effects file that we then link into the lighting file. And there's various different things going on. To figure out how that's supposed to look, also, Vivian made a, uh, a drawing to figure out the different aspects of it, to still also make it appealing. And then we just looked at the different elements. So it was supposed to expand from the salt, then carve into the material, droop down, uh, have an actual change in the color of the material to be very, uh, very visible, create some bubbles, and a little bit of smoke. And then I tried to incorporate all these individual things into the geometry node system. And here are the different layers of how that looks like. This is the base animation that I got from the animators. And then these are the different elements that are layered on top with an iterative process. And that's the final render. And that is it. And I think that was the last. Okay, before we wrap up, of course, uh, uh, please give another round of applause to the Blender developers, because they have done amazing work to make this possible. Okay, thank you for coming.
Uh, one final note, today at 5 uh, p.m. in the special interest group room, there is a Blender studio, ask us anything. So if you have any question, you can ask us anything over there. So see you later.